In this lecture, we look at death and dying. When famous people die unexpectedly, people are confronted with the reality that death happens to everyone. We have a paradoxical relationship with death. Sometimes we are fascinated by it. As tourists, we visit places where famous people died or are buried. We watch as television newscasts show scenes of devastation in natural disasters and war. But when it comes to pondering our own death, we experience difficulty. A French writer, La Rochefoucauld, said, quote, looking into the sun is easier than contemplating our own death, unquote. When death is personal, we become uneasy. Although it is hard to look at the sun, in this module, we will consider reactions to death, how people view death at various points in the lifespan, grief and mourning, and other end-of-life issues. Individual reactions to death vary and are filtered through cultural prisms. Cultural groups deal with grief in different ways, including how they express their grief through rituals and ceremonies, and different rules around what is considered respectful. There also have been historical changes. Definitions and understandings of the meaning of death have changed over time. There are also regional variations and variations depending on the age of dying and the bereaved. The death of a child, for example, is a most stressful event and can cause a major emotional crisis. A child's death arouses an overwhelming sense of injustice for lost potential unfulfilled dreams, and senseless suffering. Parents may feel responsible for the child's death, no matter how irrational that may seem. Parents may also feel they have lost a vital part of their own identity. Throughout this process, hope remains constant. It is important for all grieving people, despite their loss and experiences, to believe in the hope for healing. It is hope that gives us the amazing strength to survive loss and the belief that we will persevere. I mentioned there have been historical changes and there have been changes in death in the past century. First, death occurs later in life. Dying takes longer than in the past. Death often occurs in hospitals nowadays. The causes of death have also changed and after death, there's an interesting section in the chapter called Cultures, Epics, and Death, and it identifies some consistent themes in known ancient societies, like the uh, Neanderthals, Egyptians, and Greeks. Life actions affect one's destiny after death, and afterlife was assumed, and particular prayers and offerings were used to prevent haunting from the spirit of the dead. Contemporary religions have uh, quite a bit of diversity. Each faith and culture displays diversity in their death practices. For example, there are various perspectives on autopsy and cremation. The acceptance of cremation, autopsy, and organ donation depends as much on local norms as on religious authority. Autopsies may be legally required and yet be considered a religious sacrilege. And the conflict between religion and politics in organ donation is evident in many nations. Now, although death is one of the few truly universal experiences, each culture has its own ways of thinking about it, defining it, and ritualizing it. In understanding death throughout the lifespan, we begin with childhood. Perceptions do vary by age. Children have a, a different perspective of death. Uh, they're more impulsive and may seem happy one day and morbidly sad the next. They may take certain ex explanations, uh, such as grandma is sleeping or grandpa went on a trip, literally. Fatally ill children typically fear abandonment, so frequent and caring contact is more important than logic. Also, older children use more concrete operational cognition. They seek specific facts and they too may feel abandoned. Uh, and the grief of losing a loved one as a part of a disaster or crisis event may interrupt age appropriate activities and force a child to address issues 
for which he or she is not developmentally prepared. Emotions presented can vary greatly from sadness, anger, anxiety, and guilt. Experiences of death during adolescence differ somewhat. We'll note first that many teenagers have little fear of death, and adolescents often predict that they will die at an early age, and their developmental tendency toward risk-taking can be deadly. Romanticizing death makes young people vulnerable to cluster suicides, foolish dares, fatal gang fights, and drunk driving. Adolescents have more personal experiences with death and grief than many people realize. Surveys of traditional aged college students indicate that between 40 and 70 percent will experience the death of someone close to them during their college years. The effects of bereavement in adolescence can be quite severe, especially if the death is unexpected. Adolescence is a time of personal and physical change when one is trying to develop an identity. They may have trouble making sense of what happened. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross called the United States a culture of death deniers. And with age, responsibility for work and family, uh, death is avoided, or at least postponed. People do quit taking addictive drugs, start wearing seatbelts, and adopt other precautions. Terminally ill adults worry about leaving something undone, or leaving family members, especially children, alone. Older adults typically accept death. One sign of mental health among older adults is acceptance of their own mortality and altruistic concern about those who will live on after them. Many older adults accept death. For example, they write their wills, designate healthcare proxies, reconcile with estranged family members, and plan their funerals. The acceptance of death does not mean that the elderly give up on living. The textbook makes a distinction between a good death and a bad death. And I think we would agree that a good death is one that is peaceful, quick, and painless, and occurs after a long life, in the company of family and friends, and in familiar surroundings. People in all religious and cultural contexts hope for a good death. On the other hand, a bad death lacks these six characteristics and is dreaded, particularly by the elderly. Many would add that control over circumstances and acceptance of the outcome are also characteristics of a good death. But on this, cultures and individuals do differ. I mentioned at the uh, beginning of the lecture that there have been changes in death in the past century, and modern medicine has been a big part of that. Modern medicine can help to make a good death. For most people, death occurs at the end of a long life and illness is often treated more effectively. However, on the other side of the coin, modern medicine can make a bad death as well. People may submit to surgery and drugs that prolong pain and confusion, especially when a cure is not possible. And hospital restrictions may make dying in peace more difficult. A crucial aspect of a good death is having honest conversations. Most dying people want to spend time with loved ones and to talk honestly with medical and religious professionals. It is unethical to withhold information if the patient asks for it, although some people do not want the whole truth. Hospital personnel need to respond to each dying person as an individual, not merely as someone who must understand that death is near. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of dying, and I'm going to outline them quickly here. First is denial. The person may say, I'm not really dying. Second, anger. The individual may think or blame their doctors or family or God for their death. Third is bargaining. The person may bargain by saying, I'll be good from now on if I can live. Next is depression. I don't care about anything. Nothing matters anymore is a, a common statement. And finally, acceptance. I accept my death as part of life. Studies show that grievers don't progress through these stages in a lockstep fashion. Consequently, when any of us loses someone we love, 
we may find that we fit the stages precisely as Kubler-Ross outlined, or we may skip a, a stage or two. Uh, we may race through them or drag our feet all the way to acceptance. We may even repeat or add stages that Kubler-Ross never dreamed of. In fact, the actual grief process looks a lot less like a neat set of stages and a lot more like a roller coaster of emotions. Even Kubler-Ross said that grief doesn't proceed in a linear and predictable fashion. She wrote at the end of her career that she regretted that her stages had been misunderstood. Central to Kubler-Ross's stages is the notion that grief is a process that eventually leads to acceptance, her last stage. Although most people never stop missing their departed loved ones, the painful emotions they feel shortly after the death almost certainly eventually soften. It can be comforting to keep this in mind. If we tell ourselves this will never end, I'm weak for feeling this way, I'm going crazy, or some other negative statement, we'll wind up feeling needlessly worse. If we instead reassure ourselves that this is normal and won't last forever, it will be easier to honor our loss without added burden. Another stage model has been developed based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the bottom, there are physiological needs. First, freedom from pain. Second, safety, and that means no abandonment. Third, love and acceptance from a close family and friends. Fourth, respect from caregivers. And at the top, self-actualization or spiritual transcendence. The chapter stresses the importance of having choices in dying. And one of the better ways to die involves hospice, which involves an institution or program in which terminally ill patients receive palliative care. Hospice caregivers provide skilled treatment to uh, relieve pain and discomfort. Measures to delay death are avoided, and the focus is to make dying easier. Two principles for hospice care. First, uh, each patient's autonomy and decisions are respected, and family members and friends are counseled before the death, shown how to provide care, and helped after the death. Now Maslow's hierarchy has been adopted to hospice and palliative care. The five levels of the hierarchy of needs uh, as adopted to palliative care are number one, addressing distressing symptoms such as pain. Number two, fears for physical safety of dying or abandonment are addressed. Number three, affection, love, and acceptance in the face of devastating illness is important. Moving up to number four, esteem, respect, and appreciation for the person. And number five, self-actualization and transcendence. Maslow's modified hierarchy of palliative care needs could be utilized to provide a comprehensive approach for the assessment of patients' needs and the design of interventions to achieve goals that start with comfort and potentially extend to the experience of transcendence. Almost everyone prefers to die at home, yet most people die in an institution, surrounded by medical personnel and high-tech equipment, not by the soft voices and gentle touch of loved ones, as you can see in this CDC data. But don't be too saddened by this chart. Improvement is possible. 20 years ago, the proportion of home deaths was notably lower. Before we move on, let's clarify a couple of terms Palliative care is designed not to treat an illness, but to provide physical and emotional comfort to the patient and support and guidance to his or her family. Double effect refers to an ethical situation in which an action has both a positive effect, uh, such as administering opiates, which is intended uh, relieving a terminally ill person's pain, and a negative effect, which is foreseen but not intended such as hastening death by suppressing respiration. The success of medicine has created new dilemmas. Death is no longer the natural outcome of age and disease. When and how death occurs involves human choices. 
We are living longer lives. Later death occurs due to drugs, surgery, and other interventions such as uh, respirators, uh, antibiotics, uh, stomach tubes, uh, and uh, defibrillators. Many adults under age 50 once died of causes that now kill relatively few adults in developed nations, such as uh, complications of childbirth and epidemic diseases. We're gonna look at some ethical issues in deciding when death occurs. Death does not necessarily occur when the vital organs stop. And the evidence of death has become uh, controversial for some. Harvard physicians in the late 1970s uh, cited the cessations of brain waves as the definition of death. Current criteria involve several tests of brain functioning. Deciding when death occurs is not as straightforward as it may seem. However, doctors tend to agree that prolonged cessation of all brain activity with complete absence of voluntary movements, no spontaneous breathing, no response to pain, noise, and other stimuli uh, define death. It involves the cessation of brain waves. The EEG is flat. Medical professionals have long accepted that a flatline EEG indicates that the brain is no longer alive. However, a survey of many nations found that there is no international agreement as to brain death, nor does that seem possible in the near future. You should be aware of another condition called locked-in syndrome. It is the inability to move, except for the eyes, but brain waves are still apparent. The person is not dead. There is a table in the chapter that uh, I refer you to for additional information on these uh, syndromes. Another condition which may resemble death is a coma, which is a, a deep state of unconsciousness from which the person cannot be aroused. Some people awaken spontaneously from a coma, others enter a vegetative state. The person is not dead. An individual in a coma is alive, but unable to move or respond to his or her environment. Coma may occur as a complication of an underlying illness or as a result of injuries, such as brain injury. A coma rarely lasts more than two to four weeks. The outcome for a coma depends on the cause, severity, and site of the damage. Uh, some people may come out of a coma with physical, intellectual, and psychological problems. Some people may remain in a coma for years or even decades. For those people, the most common cause of death is infection, such as pneumonia. A vegetative state is a, a state of deep unconsciousness in which all cognitive functions are absent. Although eyes may open, sounds may be emitted, and breathing may continue, the person is not yet dead. Uh, this state can be transient, persistent, or permanent. No one has ever recovered after two years. Most who recover, about 15%, improve within three weeks. After time has elapsed, the person may effectively be dead. To clarify, a vegetative state is when a person is awake but showing no signs of awareness. On recovery from a coma, a vegetative state is characterized by the return of arousal without signs of awareness. In contrast, a coma is a state that lacks both awareness and wakefulness. A person in a vegetative state may open their eyes, wake up and fall asleep at regular intervals, and have basic reflexes, such as blinking when they're startled by a loud noise, or withdrawing their hand when it's squeezed hard. They're also able to regulate their heartbeat and breathing without assistance. However, a person in a vegetative state doesn't show any meaningful responses, such as following an object with their eyes or responding to voices. They also show no signs of experiencing emotions nor of cognitive function. In the area of death and dying, the most important bioethical issue is euthanasia, the practice of ending life for reasons of mercy. The moral dilemma becomes apparent when trying to decide the circumstances a person's life should be ended. It makes us think about the difference between killing and letting die at the end of life. In our society, this dilemma occurs most often when a person is being kept alive by machines or when someone has a terminal illness. Euthanasia can be carried out in two different ways. 
actively and passively. Passive euthanasia is a situation in which a seriously ill person is allowed to die naturally through the cessation of medical intervention. One form is a DNR, a do not resuscitate order, a written order from a physician, sometimes initiated by a patient's advanced directive or by a healthcare proxy's request that no attempt should be made to revive a patient if he or she suffers cardiac or respiratory arrest. Active euthanasia is a situation in which someone takes action to bring about another person's death with the intention of ending that person's suffering. It is legal under some circumstances in the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Switzerland, but it is illegal, yet rarely prosecuted, in most other nations. Physician-assisted suicide is a form of active euthanasia in which a doctor provides the means for someone to end his or her own life. It also raises controversial ethical issues. These include how one decides that there is unbearable suffering. Also, there is a slippery slope argument relating to death. Hastening death when terminally ill people request it uh, may cause a society to slide into killing sick people who were not ready to die, especially the old and the poor. To help assure they have choices in their deaths, people are creating advanced directives. These are documents that contain an individual's instructions for end-of-life medical care, written before such care is needed. One may be a living will, a document that indicates what kinds of medical intervention an individual wants or does not want if he or she becomes incapable of expressing those wishes. They may have a healthcare proxy, a person chosen by uh, another person to uh, make medical decisions if the first person becomes unable to do so. The final section of the chapter and this lecture takes a look at how we uh, move on after a loss and uh, find affirmation of life. Uh, I do want to mention that the terms bereavement, grief, and mourning are used uh, inconsistently and interchangeably in the literature to refer to either the state of having lost someone to death or the response to uh, such a loss. So I do want to provide some definitional clarity. Uh, bereavement refers to an objective state of loss. If one experiences a loss, one is bereaved. Uh, bereavement refers to the fact of the loss, whereas grief is the subjective response to that state of loss. Grief is the constellation of internal thoughts and feelings we have when someone we love dies. Think of grief as the container. It holds your thoughts, feelings, and images of your experience when someone you love dies. In other words, a grief is the internal meaning given to the experience of loss. Mourning is when you take the grief you have on the inside and express it outside yourself. Another way of defining mourning is the outward expression of grief. There is no one right way or only way to mourn. Uh, there may be ceremonies and behaviors that a religion or culture prescribes for people to employ in expressing their bereavement after a death. Normal grief is a powerful sorrow that an individual feels at a profound loss, especially when a loved one dies. Now we want to take a look at the difference between uh, grief and depression and how the criteria changed with the DSM-5, which involves the removal of the bereavement exclusion. Using the DSM-4, clinicians were advised to refrain from diagnosing major depression in individuals within the first two months following the death of a loved one in what has been referred to as the bereavement exclusion. By advising clinicians not to diagnose depression in recently bereaved individuals, the DSM-4 bereavement exclusion suggested that grief somehow protected uh, someone from uh, major depression. Removing the bereavement exclusion helps prevent major depression from being overlooked and facilitates the possibility of appropriate treatment, including therapy or other interventions. While the grieving process is natural and unique to each individual and shares some of the same features of depression, like intense sadness and withdrawal, grief and depression are also different in important aspects.
In grief, painful feelings come in waves, often intermixed with positive memories of the deceased. In depression, mood and ideation are almost constantly negative. In grief, self-esteem is usually preserved. In major depression, corrosive feelings of worthlessness and self-loathing are common. Someone may experience absent grief or disenfranchised grief. Absent grief is a situation in which overly private people cut themselves off from the community and customs that allow and uh, expect grief, and it can uh, lead to social isolation. Disenfranchised grief is a situation in which certain people, although they are bereaved, are prevented from mourning publicly by cultural customs or social restrictions. A good example of disenfranchised grief is the loss of a pet. To many, this is not a big deal. An animal has died. But to the person whose pet died, the loss may be very traumatic and uh, result in uh, intense grief. Disenfranchised grief stems from the social expectations we place on people to move on after loss. Those expectations can result in a lack of empathy for that person's experience. We must also remember there's not uh, a standard timetable for grief. One person may take a few weeks, while others might need anywhere from a few months to a number of years. Incomplete grief is a situation in which circumstances such as a police investigation or an autopsy interfere with the process of grieving. People are, are waiting for more information. The grief process may be incomplete if mourning is cut short or if other people are distracted from their role in recovery. Now, as we've uh, already mentioned, grief and mourning are different. Mourning involves ceremonies and behaviors that a religion or culture prescribes for people to employ in expressing their grief after a death. Mourning customs are designed to move grief from loss toward reaffirmation of life. Two phenomena that occur during mourning are placing blame and seeking meaning. Placing blame is a common impulse after death for the survivors. For example, for medical measures not taken, uh, laws not enforced, unhealthy habits not changed. The bereaved sometimes blame the dead person, sometimes themselves, and sometimes distant others. This can occur on a broad scale as nations may blame one another for public tragedies. And this blame is not necessarily rational. One can see this in the response to the mass shootings in the United States, as blame has been placed on uh, the role of hate, nationalism, the disenfranchised youth, violent video games, and on uh, the mentally ill. Unfortunately, associating this type of violence with mental illness stigmatizes a whole group of people unfairly. People also seek meaning in death. It often starts with uh, preserving memories. For example, displaying photographs and uh, telling uh, family anecdotes. Uh, support groups offer help when friends are unlikely to understand. They may not have gone through uh, that particular experience of losing someone. Organizations devoted to causes such as uh, fighting cancer and banning handguns often find supporters among people who have lost a loved one to that particular circumstance. And close family members may even start a charity. Let's emphasize that there is a diversity of reactions to death. Other people need to be especially responsive to whatever needs a grieving person may have. Grief is less likely to destroy survivors when markers or rituals are observed. Most bereaved people recover within a year. A feeling of having an ongoing bond with the deceased is no longer thought to be pathological, but it is important to remember, as I've mentioned, there is no timetable for grief. It may last for a long time, but most are able to recover and function normally. Longitudinal research has shown us there are four types of responses after a death. 66% are resilient. 15% become depressed. 10% are actually less depressed after death than before, and 9% are slow to recover or experience complicated grief. We know that personality has an effect on grief and mourning. Clinical experience has shown that people who are characteristically more flexible 
and able to use more mature coping strategies will deal with bereavement more effectively than others. Those who are psychologically healthier prior to bereavement are expected to experience the pain of loss, but are viewed as unlikely to become overwhelmed or unduly frightened by their feelings. Some research has shown that certain MBTI types have prolonged grief responses, and differences exist among those diagnosed with differing personality disorders. While there is very little research in this area, people with borderline personality disorder, which is uh, characterized by an intense fear of abandonment, may theoretically be at greater risk for complicated bereavement due to their intense emotional reactions to separation from loved ones. In conclusion, death is not a pleasant topic, as it represents to many people the end of their existence. Learning about and dealing with death is certainly a developmental process across the lifespan. How a person's understanding of death develops is also a psychological process. As the ability to think and reflect undergoes fundamental change, the view of death changes from a mostly magical one to an approach that can be transcendent beyond the mere cessation of life.